Welcome to Sandals Church. I'm glad that you guys are here. It's been a difficult week, so I'm wearing my Justin Bieber mic because he can bring us together. Um, no, actually, it's supposedly helping my squeaky voice sound more manly. So I'm glad that you're here. Hey, it's been, a, it's been a difficult week unless you live in a hole in the ground. It's been an awful ugly week for us as America. Terrible things have happened. Um, and it's, it's a difficult situation. And so some of us at Sandals Church are black. Some of us are police officers. Some of us are just confused. And we come to church from all different places, from all different perspectives. And we're going to try to make sense of this today and see what we can do as a church to promote healing in the midst of this chaos and hurt. So I'm glad that you're here today. I want to welcome our visitors and I'm glad that our members came back this week. We have a lot to talk about. And the primary thing that I want to encourage you today, if you can be think of something all throughout the message, and I want you to know that I'm not speaking to America. I'm not speaking to, you know, every ethnicity. I'm speaking to our church. I'm trying to lead our church to people who call Christ their Lord and sandals their home about what we can do in our community to help, to try to help and write this. And so I want to challenge you. In times like this, the easy thing to do is to run to your race, to run to your gender, to run to your political perspective, or to run to your experience. The biblical mandate for us who call ourselves Christians is to run to our Jesus. And that is a completely different approach in times like this. So I want you to look at your sermons and I want you to know this is just how God is good. Many of you are wondering, where is God in the midst of all of this? And the reality is he is present. Take a look at the sermon outline. It says, how can I help change the world? Now, what's amazing about this is I didn't write this on Thursday. I didn't write it on Friday. I wrote this message on Wednesday before the world went to hell this week. And that just shows you that God has a plan. He knows ahead of time what it is we need to be talking about. He knew, you know, last year before we did, when we sat down, we said we want to study two books of the Bible for 52 weeks, Luke 2:52, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He knew that we would be in this chapter on this day because God knows what we need to hear regardless of where we are in our life. And that's the miracle of God's word. No matter where you are, God's word will speak to you. And so I just want to encourage you, many of you, you come to church when you feel like it. And I'm going to tell you, the times when you need God the most is when you feel like not coming to church. That's when you need to be here. And so I'm glad that you guys are here. And I just want to begin by praying over the message. So if you bow your heads out of respect for God and we close our eyes, eyes at Sound Church because we have ADD. So let's do that. Heavenly Father God, thank you for being in the midst of us today. Father, we don't need to hear my words, but your words. So bless my mouth to speak your words and bless our ears to hear your truth. God, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, open to Acts chapter 4. Last week we were in Acts chapter 3 where an amazing miracle took place. So if you're new to Christianity and you don't know a lot about your Bible, the Gospel of Luke is all about the life, ministry, power of Jesus. It's what he did, it's how he died, and how he rose again from the dead. Then the author of Luke transitions into the book of Acts, where we're no longer talking simply about what Jesus did. We're no longer talking about what happened um, literally with Jesus in the resurrection, but we're talking about the reality of that in the church. And we transition from the power of the risen Christ to the power of the church who proclaims the reality of the risen Christ. And it's amazing. Because in the gospel, Jesus does incredible miracles. And in Acts 3 last week, Peter and John did an amazing miracle. They healed a guy. They're on their way to the temple to pray, just like you're on the way to church, to connect with God and pray and worship. And on their way, they encounter an individual who is paralyzed. They see that individual and they say, silver and gold have I none. He was begging. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Christ Jesus, rise and walk. And the guy does. And he's healed. And what we learn in Acts chapter 3 is that the power of Jesus doesn't die with Jesus, but it lives with the risen Jesus and it lives with his church who worships Jesus. But here's the challenge. They do this great miracle and not everybody cheerleads, not everybody celebrates, not everybody's excited about what's happening. The reality is they go to jail for what they do. So how can you help change the world? Number one, write this down. You got to embrace adversity and expect criticism for doing good. Here's the problem with so many Christians today. So many Christians, I hear Christians say this all the time. You've, you've probably said this or you've heard somebody say this. They say, God's just opened so many doors. God's opening doors. It's amazing how God has just opened the way for this to happen. Let me explain your theology to you in, on a practical level. So when it's easy, it's God's will. 
That's what you're saying. When you're saying that God moves through open doors, what you're saying is that's always God's will. Well, I don't know if you know this, but strip clubs have an open door policy. Come on, work with me today. That was funny. That was funny. That took hours to think about. Okay, and if you're new to Christianity, strip clubs are not the place for you. That's not where you need to go, okay? Right? That's, that, that's not where you need to participate. God's will is not for you to be there. So you can't just always trust an open door. Here's the problem. Sometimes the very thing that God calls you to do involves knocking down a door. It involves going through a door. It involves knocking on a door, persisting through closed door after closed door after closed door. Okay, when I started Sandals Church, no church would sponsor us. No one would help us. We were all by ourselves, closed door after closed door after closed door. But God called me to start a church. And so if you determine God's will based upon doors being opened or doors being closed, guess what? You're probably never going to change the world because not everybody is going to open the doors for you to do what God's called you to do. And not only that, but look at the next point. You got to expect criticism for doing good. Not every time you do the right thing does everybody applaud. Oh, thank you for standing up for the right thing. Sometimes you're isolated at work. Sometimes you're criticized at work. Sometimes you get fired for standing up for the right thing. And so guess what happens? We get tired of doing good. That's why the Bible says don't don't grow weary in doing good. Why would God's word say that? Because it's real easy to go, you know what, everybody else is cheating, everybody else is lying, everybody else is stealing, you know, everybody else is being blessed because they're doing the wrong thing, so why not do what they're doing? Because God hasn't called you to follow everyone else. He's called you to follow Him. And it doesn't matter what you do. Two years ago on Mother's Day, we helped a, a, a family that was struggling in our church. It was a single mom with a bunch of kids. Her house was run down. It was literally falling apart. The house was so dilapidated, we almost had to knock the house down to rebuild it. And so as a church for Mother's Day, we thought what we needed to do was we needed to rebuild our house. The church raised the money. The church did the labor. We did all the work. We filmed it so everybody could see. And we thought everybody would celebrate that. Oh, that's amazing. That's a good thing. Do you know that not everybody celebrated that? Some people criticized that. I heard all kinds of things. Well, you guys just wanted to show off what you did. I heard this. Well, you just help people in your church. I literally had one guy downtown criticize me because he felt like we needed to pick a stranger to bless and help. And I said, so what you want me to do is say no to the woman in my church so that I can say yes to someone who's not in my church. I said, I just don't feel like that makes any sense. And it got to the point where we, we just couldn't agree. And the reality is, oftentimes people are going to criticize you no matter what you do. Any sports fans? Raise your hands if you're sports fans, okay? Are we not critical of our teams? We are, are we not critical of our athletes? I mean, you're sitting at home on your Lazy Boy, eating Cheetos, it's all over your body. You can't even run to the, your bedroom, much less on a field, okay? And you're criticizing the athletes who get played, paid millions of dollars, and you're going, you're a bum! You suck! And then you tell your friends what you would do if you were playing. You know what you would do if you were on the field? Get killed and suck. That's what would happen to you, okay? There's a reason there's not a bunch of zeros in your bank account after your name because you are not a professional athlete, but we always think, well, I could do better. People love to email me, well, pastor, I liked your sermon, however. Okay, you get up here and preach and I'll send you some constructive criticism. You get up here and do it, right? I mean, seriously, everybody's a critic. Everybody's a Monday morning quarterback. You know what that means? We always think we would do better. We would do better when there's giant men trying to chase you down and rip your head off. (laughs) What I would do is sit back and, no, you'd die. That's what you would do. You would die and never get up. That's what would happen. They would cart you off. Okay? You got to embrace adversity and you have to expect criticism for doing good. You know why we don't change the world? Because we struggle changing ourselves. We do. I heard a pastor last week say this. He said this to a bunch of pastors. This was discouraging. He said, 85% of the people in your church will never change. I was like, well, then what am I doing? (laughs) Now, I don't know. I don't know where he got his research. But even if he's off by a lot, that's discouraging news. Why don't we change? Anybody been on a diet? Yeah, your stomach's cussing you out. Hour four. What is going on up there? (laughs) Right? We need to be filled in now. Anybody been to the gym? Right, it hurts. And your body reminds you of the stupidity for days after. It hurts. Okay, if it hurts that much to change your life, what's it going to be like when we try to change the world's life? 
Jesus is changing the world. How do we treat him? We killed him. We crucified him. He died. Jesus is in the business of changing our world. He's building a kingdom. And he's invited you to be a part of it. A world without racism. A world without murder. A world without death and disease and sickness. And he's inviting us to be a part of it. Because look, America is the greatest country on earth. And if you don't believe me, you haven't traveled. You have not been around the world. There are countries that will make you love the DMV. A DMV the DMV is a picture of expediency and organization compared to other countries. It just is. It just is. And we are blessed to be here, but America has real struggles. America has real problems. So you gotta embrace adversity and you gotta expect criticism for doing good. So I, I was like a lot of you guys this week. I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. Actually, when, when all of this really came out on Wednesday, I was at the doctor's office. I got some bad news about my knees. For those of you who've been around Sandals Church a lot, you know that I've had eight knee surgeries. And I got some bad news. They were looking at my knee on, uh, on, the, on the screen through ultrasound and they were telling me. And so I didn't know what was going on. So I was kind of late uh, to what was happening. And so I got here at church, sat down, had a discussion with a good friend of mine. And it, and it, it really quickly kind of, I felt like, turned into an us-them conversation. And I, I didn't know what to do. But the good news is, out of that conversation, what we decided as a church is, we need to try to do something. I mean, how's the world doing? Not great. So we need to try to do something. So I began to reach out to some of my African-American uh, pastor friends. I said, I need you. One of my friends is on the East Coast. I said, I need you to fly out. I need you to be here. Pastor Tim Timberlake, he's coming out next weekend. He's going to be here. He preached last, week, last weekend. Last year, he was amazing. He's coming back. Thank you. Somebody liked him. You remember? He's great. It's going to be awesome. I reached Astor out to Pastor Lacey Sykes, uh, largest African-American church in Reno Valley. Love him. I've preached at his church. Great people. I said, I need you. Reached out to some other friends. Uh, then we had the events of what happened in Dallas. I said, we got to invite the police chief. We just do. That what, what's going on has is, is, is grown. And so we reached out to uh, Chief Diaz, and he, or excuse me, yeah, Chief Sergio, Chief Sergio, and he's coming, and he's going to be a part, and he's going to be here. And so next Sunday night at 7, 7.17 at 7, that sounds cool, it's just when it is, 7.17 at 7, you guys are all invited to be here, and we're going to sit down, and we're going to have a real conversation about race. We're going to have a real conversation. And this is what I said to one of my pastor friends. I said, look, if you and I can't figure this out, there's no hope for the world. There's no hope for the world. We come from different races, but we worship the same Jesus. And he texted me back. He said, amen. He said, I will be there. I will be there. And I was so grateful to our African-American pastors who are willing to bless us with their presence and come apart and be a part of our church and have a conversation about race. Now, is everybody in our church going to like this? No. No. Is everybody going to be excited? No. Is everybody going to be thrilled? Is everybody going to be cheerleading? No. But why are we doing this? Because we're trying to do something good. We're trying to help a situation that seems hopeless. We're trying to reach out. We're trying to make a difference. We're trying to help save the world because that's the business that Jesus is in. So while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. Now, some of you are new to Christianity, so let me explain to you who the Sadducees are. There are two primary political parties 2,000 years ago in the Jewish religion. They were called Sadducees and Pharisees. I realize they both sound like a, a reason you go to the doctor. I got Pharisees or I got Sadducees. But that's, that's not what it is. It's not an infection. They're political parties in the day and age of Jesus. So the Sadducees were very, very conservative in terms of their understanding of God's law. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe in angels. They don't believe in life after death, and they didn't believe in the literal coming of the Messiah. You can understand why maybe they would have a problem with Jesus, because Jesus taught that there is a real devil, there are real demons. Jesus was ministered to by angels. Jesus preached the coming of the kingdom, and he claimed to be the Messiah. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's some political problems here. And ultimately, the Sadducees don't care what they're preaching, except for the fact that they're preaching against their political power. The Sadducees had been very blessed by Roman rule. The Sadducees were wealthy and powerful and they had influence and they didn't want anybody to rock the boat. And so this preaching about Jesus was seen as a political revolution and so they wanted to shut it down. They arrested them and said, since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. Now listen, if you're a Christian, 
If you're a Christian, I want you to listen to me. If you're not a Christian, I don't have any authority to speak into your life. If you're a Christian, I want you to notice here that the police of the day, the people in power of the day got it wrong. They arrested them for no reason. They harassed them for no reason. I want you to see the Christian response. They submit to authority. I realize that is not popular and I realize it is not easy. Welcome to Christianity. God calls us to do things that are not easy. If you call yourself a Christian, even if you feel like you're being mistreated by the law, we are called to submit to the law and then exercise a process that is honoring to God at a later time. Look, okay, I, I don't appreciate law when I'm getting a ticket. Has anybody ever felt just so grateful? I'm just so grateful that you're spending this time with me today, officer, and I just am so thankful that you're pointing out all the areas of my life in which I am illegal. Thank you so much. No, okay, no. Listen, we need to learn to be an example. We need to learn to be an example of submitting to the authorities. Listen to this, even when they get it wrong. Now, I can't tell non-Christians to do that. I can't even tell Christians to do that that aren't in my church, but I can tell you, this is what the Bible says. It says, submit to all authority. And the Apostle Paul wrote that letter to a church, listen to this, when they were surviving under an emperor named Nero. Nero was stinking crazy. Burning Christians at the stake, feeding them to lions, okay, and murdering them. That's what was happening. And the Apostle Paul said, submit to them as best you can. Now, there are times, and we could talk about that in another message, when we can't. But we are blessed to live in America, and we need to do the very best that we can. But here's, I, I want to go on a little rant here, and this is what bothers me. Notice this. It says, they arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. Look at verse 4. But many of the people heard their message and believed it. I think that one of the things that's getting lost in all of our discussion is the inherent contradiction and, and, and the inherent, I think, problem with who we trust to report the news. We turn to media to tell us what's going on. Here's the inherent conflict within their role. The media benefits from there being problems. For example, if everything is great and everything is wonderful, are you going to watch them? No, you're going to go to the beach, you're going to sit in your backyard, have a glass of wine, whatever it is you do to chill. When the world's on fire, what do you do? You stop everything and you turn to the media. And I think as a culture, we have to stand up against what's happening because the people that we're trusting to tell us the news have an inherent advantage to tell us there's bad news. And that's a problem. And what we've got to do in this process is we've got to learn to wake up and see what's happening broadly. Yes, there are terrible things happening. Yes, there's racial reconciliation that needs to take place. Yes, we, we can learn some things as police and we can, we can care for and, and minister to our black brothers and sisters who are hurting and feel disrespected. Absolutely. But we need to learn to look for the silver lining. And here's what the silver lining is. God's moving. God's moving. So you have all of this stuff that's terrible this week. It's awful. It's ugly. Lives are, are, are lost and families will never see their loved ones again. It's terrible. It's awful. Where's the silver lining in that? God is moving. I reached out to one of my black pastor friends and I said, hey man, I need you to come to our church. And he texted me back. He said, I'm glad somebody's grabbing the bull by the horns. Now, I don't know what that means at all. <laughs> like, I am not... Like, I drive through Norco. I do not live in Norco, okay? Horses scare me. Bulls terrify me. I am not grabbing a bull by the horns. So when I examine that, I kind of think the person who grabs the bull by the horns is the biggest idiot. That's what I think. He's like, way to go. Grab that bull by the horns. But I took it as a compliment, and I'm trying to do that. But here's what's amazing is every pastor that I reached out to that's, uh, that's black, you know what they said? They said, we'd love to be there. We love Sandals Church and we want to be a part of this conversation. And they said, we'll be there. It was incredible, right? So out of this horror, at least we're having the conversation. At least it's happening. And that's never going to replace the lives that were lost. And there's nothing that can bring them back. But ultimately, this is, a, this is going to bring out some good. And we've got to work together through this. So look at the silver lining here. Peter and John went to jail, but many people who heard the message believed. So the number of believers now totaled 5,000, sorry ladies, men. Apparently, they didn't have time to count the ladies. 5,000 men, some women, and some children. What's happening? The church is exploding. They're under persecution. They're not being treated fairly. But what's happening? The church is exploding. The gospel's going out. 
So as a Christian, to change the world, you need to embrace adversity and expect criticism for doing good. Next, you need to stand up for, this is key, the truth, not your truth. Every single one of you, including myself, we are trapped in our perspective by the color of our skin, our gender, our experience, our political affiliations, and our worldview. You can't step out of side of your body and examine things. You are trapped based upon who you are. And that's a problem. And let me just, just tell you that many of the crucial conversations that we have to take place in the world and in life requires that we recognize that our truth is not necessarily the truth. And for an example of that, is anybody married? Raise your hands, married people. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Ladies, you see the same thing that your husband does, but you experience a very different reality than he did. Husbands, same thing. My wife blows my mind. We have similar visions, okay? It's not like I'm 2020 and she's 2600. Our visions are very, very similar. We see the same thing. We hear the same words. We experience a different truth, okay? Okay, this is why marriage is so difficult. Single people, write this down. First, there's the engagement ring. Then there's the wedding ring. Then there's suffering. That's what happens, okay? Right? Okay, and why is that? It's not that marriage is awful. I encourage marriage. I love marriage. But here's the reality. Most married people spend their entire life, the husband in his bunker shooting, doo -doo -doo -doo, the wife in her bunker, doo -doo -doo, grenade, and throwing it over. And we wonder why all these marriages are ending. And here's the reality. You're different. You see things differently. You do. Then you pile on a difference in race, a difference in experience, a difference in political philosophy, and all of a sudden everybody's in their bunkers and everybody's shooting at everybody and we wonder why the world's going to hell. What you've got to learn to do is understand that you can witness a video where a black person is killed and see something very different. The same video, we're all looking at it and we're seeing it from different perspectives. And it doesn't mean that my truth is greater than your truth or your truth is greater than my truth. The problem is we see things differently. And let me tell you something. God doesn't have a problem with us seeing things indifferently or seeing things differently. I mean, if God didn't want us to see color, he wouldn't have invented it. I always hate when people say, we just need to be colorblind. Well, if that was God's will, we'd all be blah, <laughs> right? God apparently likes color, likes difference. And by the way, when Isaiah sees the new earth and the new heaven, Everybody's not the same shade. The Bible says people from the north, the south, the east, the west, all of their ethnicities, all of their cultural peculiarities, all of that comes and they all worship the one true Lord who loved them all and sent his son to die for them all. Okay, race is a beautiful thing. God doesn't want you to not see race. He wants you to learn to appreciate it because there are differences and anybody who says we're all the same has not been around. It's ridiculous, okay? I mean, right now, I'm being hilarious. If we were in black church, you'd be dying right now. It'd be awesome. Okay, I go and I preach at Crossword in Reno Valley. I can't preach a 40-minute message. I preach 20 minutes, and I leave 20 minutes for celebration. But at Sandals, okay, we're the golf clap church. Oh. Oh. Okay. If you're visiting from another church and you want to find us in heaven, sandals will be on the golf course. Good putt, Jesus. Good putt. It's good. It's good. You know? It's crazy. Yeah. Thank you. It's true. Like some of you are uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, it's emotion. So you've got to stand up for truth. Not your truth, his truth. And that's the problem. I mean, do you, think, do you think that there's any possibility that me and these black pastors that I'm inviting next week are going to see everything the same way? Do you, are, are you out of your mind? Right? I, I was talking with one of the pastors. I found out we graduated from the same seminary. We're trained by the same school. We're going to see things differently. The reality is, listen, just like in marriage, you're never going to save your marriage by arguing. You're going to save your marriage by listening. You got to learn to listen. Yeah, I can tell my wife all day she's wrong from my perspective. She can tell me all day I'm wrong from her perspective. But the reality is, if we want to stay married, we got to learn to listen to each other's points of view. And you got to do that. So how did Tammy and I make it? Here's the reality, because we loved something more than we loved ourselves. And it wasn't each other, right? It was our kids. 
Neither of us, neither of us wanted our kids to grow up in a broken home. And so we realized, listen, something's at stake that's bigger than us. Listen to me, Sandals Church. Something is bigger at stake here than simply race, than your love and appreciation for police. Something bigger is at stake here in its souls, headed not for hell on earth, but hell for eternity. And we got to realize, man, I may not agree with everything you say, but God loves you and so do I. And I'm going to try, I'm going to try to listen to you. And if I can find a place where we can agree and we can see things, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. And if we can't, man, we're, we're both united in Christ. And we're going to try to move forward together. And here's the challenge of Sandals Church. You know, we have black people at our church. Did you know that? I mean, don't like look at them right now, but we do. <laughs> we do. Right? Okay, listen to me. Listen to me, we, 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 we've got people from all over the world that come to Sandals Church. There are thousands of people and they come to our church and that's a beautiful thing because it's a picture of what heaven's gonna be like and it's incredible. Let me tell you something, we have black people here, we have white people here, okay, we have Republicans here and we have Democrats. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Right? We do, we do. We got smart people here and we got not so smart people at our church. It's a reality, okay, okay? And we all have to figure out how to do this together. And what we've gotta do is we've gotta stand up for the truth, not the truth that you see. And some of you this week, you're just like, you're on the internet, well, I just gotta tell these people the truth. Your truth. You know what the internet to me is? The internet to me is like a public restroom stall. Anybody ever gone to the bathroom in a public restroom stall? Some of you are like, no, I hold it till I got home. I just would never. Never do that. Like, you're going to die early. That's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> Jesus in heaven's going to be another non pooper. He's coming through. <laughs> it's going to happen. So, from time to time, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at myself. From time to time, I find myself in a public restroom going number two. So, when you do that, if you're new to pooping, you sit. And sometimes, sorry, sometimes when you sit, okay, listen, when you sit, have you ever noticed this? I'm a noticer. I notice things. But when you're in this stall, have you ever noticed that people write you messages? Like, right? Seriously, you're, you're in the stall. And I, I want to meet this. If you're one of these people that's like a stall writer, I want to meet you. Because I have never thought, you know, I'm going to share my thoughts. Where could I, where could I, where could I tell people how I feel? I know, the John. So you sit down, you know, you go in the bathroom, you're reading around, and it's not, usually it's not like words that your mother would want you to use, you know. It's not like, I love Care Bears or, you know, anything like that. And so, but okay, so, and then there's like, there's like serious people. Like there's people that are like serious about their message. And they, they don't write it on the walls. They like, they like carve it in the seat, you know. And it's just like, you're just like, I really want this message to get out, you know. And I'm like, do you know what happens down there? This is, it's a danger zone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get down there and carve something into this seat. But then it gets worse. There are people who sit down. And they read, and they say, you know what? Somebody needs to reply to this idiot, I, right? I'm going to set this guy straight. And so I always think, do you carry a Sharpie with you? Do you have to go out, get one, sit down in the same stall and set this person? You, you're such an idiot. And there's these conversations in the potty about, like, terrible stuff. And you know what? That's what Facebook is. Like, you're sitting on your computer... Right? You're sitting on your computer and you're like, you know what? I need to respond to this guy. Let me just ask you this question. If you're arguing with an idiot, what does that make you? I'm just going to tell him. And then you're all caps, 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 caps. <laughs> Exclamation point. You know, like nine. I don't know what nine means. Like if you know English, one means it's emphatic. I don't know what 17 means. Right? So... You need to respond to that. You need to say, not respond, you need to think about that, that look, man, there's a lot at stake here. And so I don't need to set people straight. Show me the verse in the Bible where it says you need to bring people to your political party. It's not in there. You don't need to set people straight. There's a lot at stake here. And let me tell you something. There's gonna be a lot of people, maybe you're visiting today for the first time and you're scared to death and you said, maybe the church has an answer. And how tragic is that? 
If people go to church this week and they hear a one-sided political view of what's happening, you're never going to hear me try to make you a Republican or a Democrat. I want you to be a follower of Jesus. I want you to be a follower of Jesus. Neither party is perfect. And as far as I can tell, both candidates are a mess. That's right. Good luck as you go into the voting booth. All right. Stand up for the truth, not your truth. So let's look at verse 5. The next day, the council of the rulers and elders and teachers of the religious law met in Jerusalem. They brought the two disciples and demanded, by what power and whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, underline these words, filled with the Spirit, because the next time you're arguing with somebody, you need to ask yourself, am I full of God's Spirit or am I full of crap? Because the answer is most of you are full of you know what, and it ain't the Spirit of God. And this is why it's so important. We're never going to lead anybody to Jesus by arguing with him. But we can lead somebody to Jesus by listening to them and loving them and pointing them to Christ. They say, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. What does this mean? This is, this is kind of hard to understand. What it means is this, is God is building a new earth and he's starting with Jesus. And if you want to be a part of this new earth, you want to be a part of this new life, you have to have faith and trust in Jesus. There's no other way. This is why it's so important. Verse 12, because there's salvation in no one else. There's salvation in no one else. Listen to what he says. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. I got news for you. If you're not a Christian, let me help you understand God. He's God, you're not. And you don't get to negotiate with God. That's part of the problem in America today is we think we can negotiate with God because we forgot he's God and we're not. We're not on equal footing. God has said, the only way I will forgive you for your sins is my son, Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I don't think that's fair. God doesn't care what you think. He does care, however, how you respond to the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. They also recognize him as men who'd been with Jesus. Let me ask you this question. When you were at work this week, at home, watching TV, did your kids, your wife, your friends, your family, do they recognize you as someone who's been with Jesus? Or do they just think you're a jerk? Understand this. The world is watching how the church responds. They're watching and they will not forget. They will not forget. But since they could see that the men had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing they could say about it. I mean, how do you argue? Like the crippled guy standing. It's kind of an awkward moment for them. They said, what should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they perform miraculous signs and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, they said, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name. And so they called the apostles back into the room and commanded them never again to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling people about what we have seen and heard. Now is the time more than ever that people need to hear you talk about Jesus and they need to see you live for Jesus. And those two things need to come together because people's lives are at stake. I want you to notice something that we'll talk about in the debrief this week that maybe you missed. It's interesting that they asked Peter and John to leave while they conferred together. Does anybody wonder how we know what they talked about when the apostles were asked to leave? Here's the answer. Some of those who were critical of the gospel early on became converts to the gospel later. You know what that means? Some of the biggest critics of Christianity will convert. And what's amazing is they hear the preaching of James and John, they see the miracles of Jesus, and they witness the character of James and John. And those three things change some of the hearts and minds of those who are going to condemn them. So the next time you're sitting in a circle of unbelievers or atheists, you need to remember that some of those will convert and many of them will convert because of your attitude and your disposition as you represent Jesus. Do you understand that? There's a lot at stake here, more than your opinion and your Facebook post. 
So some of us need to stop hashtagging and start thinking. Start thinking about the people and the scope of influence you have because you have no idea how many people are looking at your page. How many people are looking at what you say. Next, we got to ask God for courage when you're afraid. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign. The healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. Look at verse 24. This is so important. When they heard the report, what is the response of the early church? Okay, you watch the news. What's your response to the news? You're on the internet. What's your response to what's going on? You see, unfortunately, for many of us this week, this was yet another proving ground that there's still sin inside of you. For many of you, things bubbled up within that you thought were dead long ago. Some of you had anger, resentment, bitterness, racism, all kinds of attitudes that God says you got to kill if you're a follower of Christ. And those things came out of your heart, out of your mouth, out of your fingers and onto the internet. And things that should be dead in you came alive this week. I want you to notice that the church doesn't protest, the church doesn't march, what do they do? They pray, they pray. Nothing wrong with protesting, nothing wrong with marching. The church is powerful when she prays. The church prays. Look what happens. How did they pray? They said, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness for preaching the word. I want you to notice here, they didn't pray for protection. They prayed for boldness. God, you've heard what they're saying. Don't let us shut up. Let us get louder and proclaim the name of Jesus. Why? Because souls are at stake forever. Forever. They said, stretch out your hands, God. Stretch out your hands, God, with healing power. Does our world, does our country need healing? Do our neighborhoods need healing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Our country has struggled with the issue of racism since its inception. We've been working on this issue for a hundred of years. And yes, we've been making progress, but there's still so far to go. We need healing. Healing. Look at this. It says, may miraculous signs and wonders be done through the holy name of your servant, Jesus. How awesome would that be? If people saw God do amazing things in the name of Jesus Christ through Sandals Church and we said, Jesus, we can't fix this, but you can. And we cried out to him. And our whole community, San Bernardino, Riverside, all of the Inland Empire said, we, we, the world's a mess, but God's doing something at Sandals Church. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. Can you imagine that our prayers are so fervent that the presence of God descends upon this place and the actual physical building can, can, cannot contain the weight of God's spirit and it begins to stretch in such a way that these beams begin to rattle. And you go home, you say, well, man, there was an earthquake and everyone else is like, what are you talking about? It wasn't an earthquake, but it was a God quake where he shows up and he fills us with his presence and his power. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and then they all preached the word of God with boldness. Last point, you wanna change the world? You gotta stay united and committed with my church, your church, our church. Look, whenever we have controversial issues like this, some of you are not gonna agree with my stance. It is entirely possible that I offend both black people and police officers. I am gifted that way. <laughs> it just is. And let me just tell you, I love, love, love the black people in our church. I adore them and I appreciate them. And I've hugged so many of them this weekend. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And I also love, love, and adore the police officers who protect us and put their lives on the line to save us. Did you know that right now as I speak, we have police officers in our church who work during the week in our community and then volunteer their time on the weekends to protect you and keep you safe in case some nut job comes in here with a gun shooting? Did you know that? They're doing that right now for you. For you. And we need to thank them and we need to appreciate them. Because you know a couple weeks ago when that woman was trying to stab me with a pickaxe, you know who came running? 
The cops. You know what everybody else is doing? Video doing their phones. Let's watch this white guy get it. I'm serious, everybody's gonna film me dying. Look at this, all right? Look, man, police officers are not perfect. Some of them may be racist. Why? Because they're just like you. And they make mistakes. And unfortunately, in their profession, their mistakes are deadly. We need to pray, we need to come together, and we need to show the world that our love for Jesus is greater than the color of our skin, greater than our political preference, and greater than we see the world. Because when that happens, the world's gonna take notice that something's different in us. But if we are just as conflicted and just as divided, what solutions do we have to offer to a broken world? We have none. Acts 4, 32 through 35, it says all the believers were united in, a, in one heart and mind. You know, a lot of times we misquote the Lord's Prayer. When people talk about the Lord's Prayer, they say, that's really not the Lord's Prayer. You know what that is? It's the prayer that He taught us to pray. The Lord's Prayer sounds like this. Father, make them one as you and I are one. That's the Lord's Prayer. His prayer for us is that we would be one in the way that God the Father and God the Son are one. How are we doing? I don't know if that prayer can be answered in this lifetime. I hope that it can. And I hope that we can be an example of that unity. We have to stay united and committed with my church. Look, we're not going to agree on everything. We're not. We're not. It says all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. You want to know what the evidence of the Holy Spirit looks in your life? When you quit thinking about yourself and you start thinking about others. That is the greatest gift the Spirit gives. You see, moving to the kingdom of Jesus is moving from the kingdom of me to the kingdom of we. It's his church, his tribe, his family. So they shared everything they had and the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. And there were no needy people amongst them because those who owned land and houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and the apostles would give it to those who were in need. This is the picture of the church. This is a picture, a moment of unity. Unfortunately, the church does not stay here. In Acts chapter 6, the church will deal with racism for the first time. Between the Hellenistic speaking Jews and the Hebrew speaking Jews. Almost every epistle that you read, there's a struggle between ethnicities. There's a struggle between the sexes. There's a struggle between the wealthy and the poor, the powerful and the powerless. And the reality is Christ has called the church to be an example of the world of the healing that can take place. And we need to take that seriously. Because the reality is we are stronger together than we are apart. And what God wants to do right now is unite us. What Satan wants to do is divide us. Division is always the enemy of the devil. That's why I hated math in elementary school. <laughs> You're listening. Division's hard, man. But everywhere else in life, man, it's easy. Listen, we need to be united and we need to be one. We're going to do something a little different that we don't normally do at our church. Matter of fact, I, I can't think of a time we've done this. Um, so if you're a germaphobe, get ready to panic. What we're going to do is we're all going to stand up and we're all going to unite and hold hands and pray. We got enough Purell outside so you can bathe yourself in it. If God, if God can heal a cripple guy for 40 years, he can take the bacteria off your hands. So let's trust him in this. So let's all reach out. Let's all hold hands. We need to be one church. Because the reality is Jesus loves us. He loves us all. My favorite song, the first song I remember singing in the church is Jesus Loves the World. Red, yellow, black, and white. They are all precious in His sight. Yes, Jesus loves the children of the world. And the Bible says, regardless of our age, we're all His kids. And He loves us. And He sent His Son to die for us on the cross. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and let's just cry out to God. Heavenly Father, we unite in hands because You have asked us to be one as You and the Father are one. God, we fall horribly short in this area. God, we divide over everything, over race, over religion. We divide over our sex, our gender. We divide, God, over our political stance and party. God, forgive us 
for not taking seriously your request to be one as you and the Father are one. God, we confess our sins this week to you, our rage, our anger, our malice, our racism. God, our indifference, our laziness when it comes to this issue. God, we confess, Lord, just an unwillingness to understand our black brothers and sisters and what they're feeling. God, we confess a lack of appreciation to our police officers and how they protect us. Lord, let this place be a place of healing. Let this place be a place of invitation. Holy Spirit, fall upon us in such a heavy way that we are different from this point on. We love you, Jesus, but we need your love in us. We need your blessing in us. Fill us, Father, with your spirit. Give us your grace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.